welcome everyone um, to uh, the National Museum of the American Indian, the Living Earth Festival, and today's program. Um, my name is Elizabeth Gish. I coordinated the seminars and symposia program here at the museum, and I'm delighted to welcome you. And also, I extend a very warm welcome to our uh, web audience, our virtual audience. Welcome. Um, today's program, with its <coughs> emphasis on engaging and teaching community residents to become part of an environmentally conscious future, is a most fitting part of the Living Earth Festival, which celebrates native contributions to protecting the environment, sustaining lifeways and traditions, and explores the contemporary environmental issues of importance to all people crucial importance to all peoples. So I'm very excited to hear our speakers today. Um, just one thing I wanted to mention, if you have a cell phone, please turn it off. We're webcasting, um, and it, that way we won't disrupt the program. Um, we'll hold any questions till after all our speakers have done their presentations, and there's a microphone on a stand in the center aisle towards the back um, and please use that so our web audience can hear your question. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure now to introduce Michelle DePass. She's the Assistant Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency's Office of International and Tribal Affairs, and she will deliver opening remarks for us today. Michelle DePass was confirmed by the Senate as the Assistant Administrator, Office of International Affairs, in April 2009. As of March 2010, she assumed leadership of EPA's tribal portfolio. And now, as the Assistant Administrator for International and Tribal Affairs, is responsible for the full range of EPA's environmental policy development and program implementation in tribal lands and in sovereign nations outside of US borders. In this capacity, DePass has instituted a vision focused on advancing environmental activities in cooperation with uh, domestic and global partners in order to promote sustainability, increase equity, facilitate commerce, adapt to climate change, and ensure national security. To further all these goals, her office has successfully implemented air and water quality, waste management, environmental education, and public health-focused programs here in the U.S. and around the world. DePass is a lawyer, public administrator, and policy analyst who has worked with environmental and human and civil rights organizations, academic institutions, and labor. She has also worked in all levels of government, including city, state, and federal. DePass came to the EPA after serving as Environment and Community Development Program Officer at the Ford Foundation. As Program Officer, she was responsible for supporting the development of sound environmental policies and practices in the local, national, and international arenas. Much of DePass's experience is in the realm of environmental and social justice, negotiating on behalf of community groups, and advocating for better environmental policy at both the national and international levels. As DePass herself noted uh, at her confirmation hearing, protecting our environment for the benefit of all Americans has not only been my career, it is my passion. And for me, this passion is not simply a question of protecting our precious natural resources. Rather, it is about protecting people and future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Michelle DePass. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody out here in our audience, our distinguished guests, and also to those that are watching us on the World Wide Web. I'd really like to thank the Smithsonian Institution and the National Museum for the American Indian for hosting this fabulous, fabulous symposium. Specifically, I'd like to thank Elizabeth Gish and Carolyn McClellan for inviting EPA to participate and for working with my staff since January to make this happen. 
I hope everyone is having a great time at the Living Earth Festival. I'm excited to bring my family, where Alexander, making sure that he doesn't start crying, but that he's happy seeing mom on stage, and my husband Joshua, to enjoy. It's very rare I have the opportunity to be able to have my family with me as I talk about what I love, my passion, which is my work for the Environmental Protection Agency. So my job here today is to introduce some amazing people and a great program. So as the Assistant Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency's Office of International and Tribal Affairs, the first term of the Obama administration, I had the honor of combining our Office of International Affairs and our Office of Tribal Affairs. By placing these two shops in the same arena, we were making a very strong statement that we view day-to-day -day work that we do with tribes as engagement with sovereign nations. It is a move that I, sp I think speaks to the respect that the Environmental Protection Agency has for working with Indian country. In addition to creating my office, the Office of International and Tribal Affairs also developed EPA's Tribal Eco Ambassadors Program during the first term of the Obama administration. Professionally and personally, we at EPA, and more specifically, my office, are ardent supporters of tribal environmental programs. And student-driven research is at the heart of it. We wanted to reach out officially to tribal colleges and universities. We wanted a program where tribal, college, and surrounding communities had the opportunity and the ability to solve the environmental issues that were relevant and important to them while allowing training for young environmental professionals because they are our future for our sustainability of our planet. In 2011, in partnership with the American Higher Education Consortium, we launched the first year of the program. We awarded partnerships with eight different tribal colleges and universities on projects varying from air and water quality monitoring to the development of sustainable building materials. Here are just a few results from that first year. Campus sidewalk and structures built with carbon negative building materials. The sampling of over two dozen private drinking water wells. The collection of hundreds of hours of indoor air quality monitoring data. And water quality assessment of a popular public swimming hole the creation of a sustainable campus recycling program, the development of a tribal college university's first online course focused on the emerging topic of epigenetics, the engagement of an entire tribal college university campus in an energy efficiency contest. Another direct result of the first year was the amount of new partnerships formed between professors and EPA scientists. The TCU professors also reached out to larger universities and NGOs to help get the job done. These include experts from Center for Disease Control, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, John Hopkins, the University of Arizona, and the University of Colorado. We as an agency saw that the impacts of these projects were far, far, far reaching. We didn't even anticipate how far reaching they would be. Several students in the program expressed that they wanted to now focus their studies on environmental issues. You and I both know that to ensure environmental protection, we must grow our future environmental planners, directors, engineers, and advocates. What has been truly exciting is to watch the program itself grow. After this successful first year, we continued into the second year and EPA awarded four larger partnerships to tribal colleges and universities, two of them broadening the research from the first year. As a former grant manager, I loved seeing the scaling up of this program. The four projects from this past year include Dr. Marco Hatch, Northwest Indian College. This was the testing of marine biotoxins in shellfish 
to reduce illness and improve opportunities for tribal members. Dr. Renee Default and Zara Berg from Fort Peck Community College. This was a program that determines the role consumption of high fructose corn syrup plays in the bioaccumulation of environmental mercury. Dr. David Stone and Jane Latane from Tohoto Odom Community College, the development of a carbon negative building material technology for solid waste recycling, CO2 sequestration, hydrogen generation, and water treatment. And Margaret Mayer of Diné College, teaching the relevance of using data for understanding climate change. In a, few in a few moments, you and I will both hear about the results of these projects, about the differences that these professors and students are making in their schools, their communities, and their own lives. I'm looking forward to it, as over the past two years, this group has inspired my colleagues, tribal program managers at the Environmental Protection Agency, senior officials at the Environmental Protection Agency, and scientists. They are reminding us to continue to look for ways that we can support and partner our future tribal environmental leaders. Finally, I want to remind you that EPA is proud to request applications for the third year of the Tribal Eco Ambassadors Program. We're looking forward to awarding four or five new projects for the 2013-2014 academic year. The deadline is coming up. It's July 31st. Check out our website, www.epa.gov backslash tribal, for more information. And Marissa McInnes, who you'll meet later on my staff, is also here today. And we'll be happy to discuss the program with you. This program really means a great deal to me. As I visited Indian country and seen eco-ambassadors in action in their own backyard, I've really learned the importance of working with Indian country, with students, with tribal colleges and universities, and learned what the successes of this program have been. I look forward to continued work together and seeing more of the impacts as we continue this program in the coming years. In closing, I'd like to thank the Tribal Eco Ambassadors for coming and their students for all their hard work, dedication, to making this program a success together. The true value of this initiative has been defined by the incredible work that you're about to hear. And again, thank you to the National Museum of the American Indian for graciously coordinating this event. Thank you for taking the time to listen about a very important national program and hearing our tribal partners that are working to protect our human health and the environment. Thank you. Those were really eloquent and important opening remarks. Thank you very much, Michelle. Now, our first speaker is Margaret Mayer. Uh, as uh, Michelle mentioned, she's an environmental science instructor at Diné College in Sale, um, Arizona, within the Navajo Nation. And uh, she is the pr principal investigator for the Tribal Eco Ambassador Climate Change Data Collection Program. And we have uh, students there analyzing data from CO2 monitors in mountains in Arizona, Colorado, and Utah, and conducting indoor air quality studies using dust tracks and hogans and trailers. Um, I'll let Margaret tell you more about that, but I would, she has taught at community colleges from Seattle to Maine, led field study programs in New Zealand, Europe, and the US, and worked as a botanist for the state of Maine, and a ranger naturalist for various national parks. Please welcome Margaret Mayer. Thank you. Welcome, Margaret. Very Thank, you. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Okay, so our project involved uh, climate change, and that's a big topic today. And we wanted students to be able to develop some research skills and also be able to analyze data involving CO2, which as you know, is one of the main climate change gases. So we looked at 
the data from different monitors. These are monitors on the tops of mountains throughout the southwest, and you can access websites looking at the data. And we also had a specialist come from NAU to teach students how to use dust tracks to analyze and research indoor air quality in their Hogan's, which are wood structures, usually using um, coal or wood heat and, or trailers. And then what we wanted was outreach, where our interns would then go present what they learned, their research skills, into classes, as well as the community. As we said, there are two different parts of our study. One was outdoor air quality, which involved climate change, monitoring the CO2 gases from the monitors on tops of mountains, and then indoor air quality. And uh, this is a picture on the bottom of Roof Butte. This is right in back. I, I'm from Diné College. This is right in back of our college, the main campus in Saley, beautiful Chuska Mountains. And we have a CO2 monitor there. And then we analyze the data from that as well as from other monitors throughout the Southwest. And then the students looked at some of this data and they wanted to correlate some of the readings. They saw there were some spikes in the readings and they wanted to correlate it with wind direction. And so the bottom states, they began looking at airport data, including the local wind, uh, Window Rock Airport. This is looking at the dust track on the left, very expensive equipment that we bought for this project. And um, if you, on the right, shows one of the sample stoves, people using wood or coal, and we were measuring, we, the students would go into their own homes or family homes to measure the uh, dust particles. This, well, these are sensing units that we were supposed to use, but unfortunately uh, they weren't available as was supposed to have occurred. So hopefully we're going to be doing that this current year. Students went, traveled to uh, Boulder. So they worked with NCAR scientists as well as scientists from the University of Colorado, learning more how to analyze CO2 data as well as indoor air quality techniques, as well as outreach um, ways of presenting the material and engaging students. This is a graph from some of the student interns work. You see this is from Ernest, and this shows data in a day from uh, what was going on in his trailer. And you see there's a big spike right in the middle of the day. And so students wanted to uh, correlate what these graphs showed to activities in the house. And indeed, someone was smoking at that high peak. And then you also see high spikes early in the day. People begin to get up. They're moving around. They're stirring up dust. So it's interesting to correlate what they show on graphs as to activities. These are graphs from the outdoor monitoring uh, sites, Roof Butte. And in the middle of the graph, you see a big spike, right? Big blue spike. And that indeed correlates with the change of direction um, of the wind as students discovered from the Window Rock uh, Airport. So they were right in their hypothesis, which was very interesting to determine. And then we were involved in outreach. They learned different activities which they could do in outreach to the community. And they use these in coming into my classes. I teach a variety of environmental science classes, including climate change. And that course I developed with six other tribes. And then right now, we have summer internships, and they're continuing to do that right now for workshops and with students on the K to through 12 level. And this is uh, noting what is occurring right now, this summer. 
And uh, so they were developing hypothesis and assisting in designing a simple sampling protocol on ambient air quality. They reviewed literature involving the indoor stove coal project meeting. They developed a poster. They're doing that right now for presentation to our college and the communities. And right now, they're working with K through 12 students and workshops. And so that's my project. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, our next speakers are Renee Dufault and Zara Berg, who work together in the Tribal Eco Ambassadors Program. Renee Dufault is the Executive Director of the Food Ingredient and Health Research Institute, which she founded after working for 20 years in the environmental health field at the U.S. Public Health Service. Her findings of mercury in high fructose corn syrup led to high profile publication in clinical journals and work with a collaborative team to determine how this source of mercury exposure might interact with other epigenetic risk factors to affect learning in children. Uh, Duvault is recognized as a biomedical expert in the areas of fructose, mercury toxicology, epigenetics, and environmental hazard assessment. She teaches a popular online a macro epigenetics, excuse me, course through Fort Peck Community College in Fort Poplar, in Poplar, Montana, and an online community environmental hazard assessment course through the United Tribes Technical College. And Zara is a first generation college student from uh, Helena, Montana. Uh, Berg attended college at Montana Tech of the University of Montana, where she majored in biology. Berg obtained her Master of Science in Interdisciplinary Toxicology from Texas A&M University. She is currently Science Instructor and Department Chair of the Science Department at Fort Peck Community College. Please join me in welcoming Renee Dufault and Zara Berg. And uh, welcome. And I'm really appreciative of Zara coming with, as you can see, um, something that hasn't slowed her down at all. So, hello everyone. I'm Zara Berg, and this is Renee Default. And we had a collaborative effort on our project through Fort Peck Community College, Northeast Montana Health Service, and the Food Ingredient and Health Research Institute. Our project is titled Mixed Intervention Study Using Applied Macroepigenetics, Reducing Risk Factors for Type 2 Diabetes. Okay, so macroepigenetics is best described as an analytical approach that can be used to understand how environmental and dietary fac factors interact to regulate genes that protect health or make us more susceptible to diseases. So for example, our um, environmental mercury exposure and high fructose corn syrup consumption can impact the PON1 gene tra transcription, making us more susceptible to the harmful effects of organic phosphate exposure. Um, so our pilot study um, approach was our two major interventions employed to reduce risk factors for type 2 diabetes, macroepigenetic nutrition intervention courses, and a support group for the elimination of corn sweeteners and the high fructose corn syrup product line. Ten community members were recruited through newspaper articles and a 90-minute ma macroepigenetic workshop. Participants screened at the health clinic by nursing staff to determine eligibility. So for eligibility, you had to be 20 years of age on no medication except for birth control. Okay. Um, the clinic nursing staff collected body measurements. So we got height, weight, um, BMI, and they also collected laboratory um, samples for analysis, which included glucose, insulin, mercury. Measurements were taken pre and post intervention of the online course um, or the support group. Clinical nursing staff randomly assigned five people um, 
to refrain from corn sweeteners. So as part of our recruitment drive, we um, delivered three 90-minute uh, presentations on the role of mercury in high fructose corn syrup and its relationship to de the development of insulin resistance. And this is the macroepigenetic model for insulin resistance. Uh, and I'll, we'll, after, the after today's presentation, if you want to stay and hear more, then we'll go into it in detail. So, but the major uh, take home message of the workshops were that there's mercury residue found in high fructose corn syrup and corn syrup. Um, and mercury exposure leads to uh, bioaccumulation of mercury and is associated with the development of insulin resistance. And insulin resistance increases the chance of developing heart disease and type 2 diabetes. So the students who participated in the online uh, intervention course uh, were able to learn research skills, and uh, we, we were able to measure how well they were able to uh, conduct their research by what they learned. Um, we also used an online survey to, to measure those changes and determine if there was any change in their health status. So the, the course um, consisted of nine modules of instruction, and there was also a weekly discussion board where students could talk about uh, what they were learning. And in some cases, they did field trips, and they could talk about what they found. For example, one field trip, they went to the uh, commodities program to see what the free commodities were uh, over the years, and, and they found out that uh, for many years, corn syrup was a free commodity, and it, they had uh, used that to, uh, in their recipes for making uh, fry bread. Another way that they conducted research was they used an online database. The USDA has a law-suggested uh, food availability spreadsheet system where they keep track of all the different uh, commodities that are consumed by the American public. And so the students looked at what, what, what people were consuming in 1970, and then they looked at those same commodities in 2010. So they saw that red meat consumption had gone down from 1970 to 2010, and salad, salad cooking oil consumption had gone up to 36 pounds per person per year. Apple juice consumption had gone up, yet milk consumption had gone down. So, and then they saw that uh, high fructose corn syrup consumption uh, was 0 0.3 pounds per year per person in 1970, and that by 2010, it was 28.7 pounds per person. So they were able to construct this, a chart like this where they they saw that the uh, type of sugar being consumed in the U.S. had changed over time. Uh, cane and beet sugar had, consumption had decreased. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. Okay, here we go. 35% um, uh, and high fructose corn syrup consumption had increased to 9,467%. So the type of sugar being consumed had changed over time. Uh, in another module of instruction, they learned about uh, pesticide exposure. And they, they visited the pesticide data program uh, on the USDA website. And they were able to access reports of, of different uh, years of uh, pesticide data collection. And they found that. Uh, Americans were consuming, on average, 95 pounds of wheat per person per year. All right. Okay, right there. And uh, that as the wheat samples were uh, analyzed, uh, hundreds of bags of wheat were uh, collected for analysis during the years 2004, 2005, and 2006. 
and up to 50% of the time, uh, then the wheat, the, samp the wheat was contaminated with one or more uh, organophosphates. So that means for every bag of uh, conventionally grown wheat flour that you buy, you have a 50% chance of being exposed to organophosphate pesticides. They also learned about how high fructose corn syrup is metabolized. They uh, viewed a 90-minute video by Dr. Lustig, who's a pediatric endocrinologist, and they learned that uh, fructose uh, is uh, metabolized much like ethanol, which is just al alcohol. So we tell our pregnant women to refrain from alcohol consumption while they're pregnant, but we don't tell them to uh, stop consuming uh, beverages with high fructose corn syrup, which those beverages, uh, if you over consume them, you will get the same problems that you would get with alcohol consumption. So uh, overexposure to alcohol might cause fetal alcohol syndrome in pregnancy, whereas overconsumption of high fructose corn syrup might cause autism. So we, we also looked at how what we eat impacts gene transcription. For example, fructose consumption suppresses a uh, PON1 gene, which is responsible for producing an uh, enzyme, paraoxinase, which you need for your body to be able to metabolize and excrete organophosphate pesticides. And that if you are not able to excrete those pesticides, then you know, you're at risk of uh, having a child with autism when you're pregnant. So we were able to measure whether or not the course, the online course was effective at reducing consumption of food commodities that cause negative epigenetic changes by uh, do, uh, administering a survey, an online survey, before and after the course where we uh, asked questions regarding food frequency. How often did uh, the student consume fast food? How often did they eat green leafy vegetables and so forth? So prior to the uh, start of the intervention course, uh, the uh, diet score uh, the, was 16, the mean for the group. And then after the intervention, that score went up to 23.2. So they uh, improved their diets in the direction of healthier eating meaning they ate more whole foods, more organic, less salt, and less refined sugar, and less processed food at the end of their uh, class. So another intervention was the uh, support group. So with the support group, we did a shopping guide with food ingredients to avoid and included all um, products from the high fructose corn syrup line, which included corn syrup, modified cornstarch, dextrose, multidextrose, multidextrin, and fructose. And then we also went over instructions on reading food labels and nutrition facts. And then we took them on a field trip to the grocery store, one-on-one -on -one interaction to teach them how to read food labels and learn about their favorite meals. Um, and then for their favorite meals, we found alternative recipes for, um, for preparing these meals without using corn sweeteners or spice packets that had multidextrin in it. Um, and then we also gave them tips for increasing the intake of foods that are high in micronutrients like zinc, magnesium, selenium, calcium, phosphorus, so they might include um, more spinach in their diet and Brazil nuts, which contain selenium. And by including micronutrients, it helped eliminate heavy metal metabolism or regulate appetite. Um, and this is um, our results for their glucose levels. And you can see before we started the project, their mean glucose levels was 100.2, okay. um, which um, means that they're already in the range for insulin resistance. And I'll let Renee take over. See if I just get on the right slide. So the mean fasting glucose for the group prior to the interventions was 100.2. So that falls in the range of the uh, impaired fasting glucose for diagnosing individuals at risk of developing diabetes. The mixed interventions that we employed 
during the study reduced the mean fasting glucose of the group to 87.9, which was well below the impaired fasting glucose range. So type 2 diabetes prevalence is higher in countries with higher high fructose corn syrup availability. Um, that study was recently published in 2013. And so genetically related indigenous uh, Pima in Mexico have time, five times less type 2 diabetes than the uh, Pima located in Arizona. And the uh, uh, Pima in, in Arizona have the highest diabetes prevalence in the world with 33.5% of adults affected. So why would the uh, Pima on the Mexican side of the border have five times less uh, type 2 diabetes? So if you look at the uh, insulin resistant values for our, what we did and then the, another study on the, oops, the, the Pima, uh, on the uh, United States side, their level of insulin resistance was 3.07 in a group of uh, 449 people ages 20 and older that were not diagnosed with diabetes, but they, the researchers kept track of their health for many, many years, and, uh, and then uh, they compared it to the uh, Pima on the other side of the border, which was... Uh, uh, much lower insulin resistance. So that, those were those, uh, those findings. And then here were ours. Our insulin resistance levels are going down after the intervention. So uh, there must be some reason why uh, these, uh, this group of people have lower insulin resistance in Mexico. Well, the reason why probably is because uh, the Mexican Pima do not consume high fructose corn syrup. Because, you know, everybody buys Mexican Coke. It's got the real thing, real sugar. So the design and content of the macroepigenetics nutrition intervention course and the support group features played a role in helping the participants make diet behavioral changes, leading to significant reduction in fasting glucose, weight, BMI, um, these changes in diet behavior, fasting glucose and weight and BMI likely reduce their participants' risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So nutrition education programs need to be incorporated in the macroepigenetic principles. And, oh, go ahead. Okay. So in the final part of the module was um, for the students to share with the community about what they learned from the macroepigenetics course, and being in the support group. Um, and then some of them made brochures, one made a Facebook page, and others made PowerPoints. And this is just some examples of the work they created. Um, so we would like to thank, Renee and I would like to thank our students, the Environmental Protection Agency, American Indian Higher Education Consortium, Fort Beck Community College, um, the Food Ingredient Health Research Institute, and Northeast Health Montana Services. So thank you. And then these are just some of our references. Thank you, Renee um, and Sarah, for a really interesting program um, presentation that gave us a lot to think about, I, I, I believe. Our, our final speakers before we have a question and answer panel discussion is Dr. David Stone and Richard Pablo. Um, Dr. Stone is an environmental scientist who specializes in iron chemistry, and his focus for the last 10 years has been on corrosion processes that can be used to recycle solid wastes like crushed glass and waste steel dust into solid building products. He's especially interested in those processes that can also capture CO2 and convert them to useful material. And this work has led him to the Tohono Autumn Community College on the Tohono Autumn Nation where he currently is an EPA eco ambassador. And speaking with um, Dr. Stone is Richard Pablo, who is a student at the Tohono Autumn Community College, 
where he's a member of the Student Senate and of the Himdag Culture Committee. He is also uh, working on the recycling glass project on the uh, nation, starting with glass bottles that are collected by hand in the desert. Richard is committed to creating beneficial change among the nation's communities in a way that integrates environmental, spiritual, and social issues. So um, welcome, uh, David and Richard. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Richard Pablo. I'm a student intern assistant for the Echo Ambassador Internship at the Autumn Community College. And we've been working on this project for a amount of two years, two years. And upon coming to this project, Jane Latinay had offered me a job to work for the Eco Ambassador Internship and told me that she had this guy, David. And they're planning on working on glass, which was really peculiar. And I had just sobered up like two years before. A year before I was in school and I said, well, they're giving money for school, so I'm gonna go to school. And I decided to go to school not knowing what was going to come my way and with all those thoughts of education. And the school has only been in existence for like 12 years, our college, our community college, and really took a turn in my life. Once I got to school, not even the first two weeks, I was put on the student board, student senate, the kids wanted me to sit on the board as a representative for the school. And I couldn't really believe what was happening. I had only been in sobriety for about a year. And I've seen the repercussions of alcoholism on our reservation through the last 30 years and how it has took a toll and really just decimated the, the culture but I think this goes back to intergenerational trauma through, through the years, through Euro civilization as they infiltrated down to our reservation. And uh, really, I never took, I never had no idea that all this, just picking up glass and being on the Echo Ambassador internship would even affect me this way. So I said, yeah, I'll take the job and they're going to pay me to pick up glass. What Jane didn't, what Jane Latine didn't know, or even David, is that we had glass on the reservation spots like this all over, even in the communities. And, and this is really an eyesore. Even our community members are really... <clears throat> I guess I would say really ashamed, even if I'm to speak about it in front of anybody or just in that way, they don't even want to look at it themselves. But with that, this has floored all kinds of families, foundations, children with dreams, families with dreams. And so in my thoughts on doing that, I decided, yeah, I'll do this. And slowly, I, I automatically, I showed David, because they, they thought we were going to Tucson to pick up glass at the city dump. <clears throat> so automatically, I went out and showed him some spots. As, as I started picking it up, I started thinking about the desert, the trauma, all the things that started happening to the people, the spirit, and how it just really took a generation of tradition, traditional knowledge, traditional spiritualism, 
and just broke the spirit of the people. So we started gathering and working with communities, a community effort. Even uh, a lot of our men are in jail, a lot of our women, young mothers with children, don't really have strong foundations for education and living on government assistance, a lot of those things. So in our community, we started getting the people that owed hours for probation with the jails. We started working with the community, community effort. All we had to do was just let the word out that we want to start cleaning up our communities. And they just started helping. And this is just with a few surrounding communities, the main town of Sells. So in doing this, the kids don't have to look at all the, the bottles and, and think that less of themselves and start having dreams because our school had only been in existence for like 12 years. So I started thinking to myself, well, in doing this, the kids can just clear up their focus, their minds, and they, they can start taking those sciences that have just been presented and water, air, and start protecting the land. And with TEK, traditional educational knowledge, I'm really glad that they're taking it in the process, EPA and, and White House is finally looking at those traditional knowledges because this really goes to everyone in the country. That if we start respecting our mother, start entrusting in her and start healing her because she's only mimicking what we're giving her. She's only mimicking what we're putting out to the earth. And in fact, those kind of things are gonna come back to us. If we don't respect them and look to our children to learn these knowledges, I really acknowledge traditional, traditional people, traditional education and traditional knowledges even with the foods from the earth, start talking to the earth, the spirit, and all those things that entail the earth and the sky, the universe. So we started doing this by hand, and this was middle of the summer, and dead hot summers, like 100 all the time, and dry hot summer. But in doing this, I began to meditate my thoughts, and I would just love doing this. and. I don't know how many of those pounders I broke for a whole year we were doing this like this. Only a few of us and getting the community to help us. A year passed and we finally got a machine. <clears throat> so we started working with, we built a relationship with waste management. And waste management takes all that glass to Tucson, but which costs them thousands and thousands of dollars to ship it out. So we started building, working with our communities, made our little enclosure and started pounding. That's the glass, it comes in three courses. It just becomes a sense like gravel, fine gravel and coarse sand. And so we started working on bricks. Bricks and tile, all these things. So, in cleaning all of this, we started putting up tile, bricks. We even built a chair, and it's all part of CO2. But in knowing this and understanding it from David's perspective, it was really cool just to take all that. That's a lot of glass just goes into that, but there's a lot of neighborhoods that are full of that. And so with working with that, we begin to understand that for a while. I'll let David talk. Thank you, Richard. Um, it's an honor to work with you and to help you and your people in this way. I'll just say a couple things related to the technical uh, aspects of this process. As Richard uh, began to say, uh, CO2 is also incorporated as the third waste product besides glass and waste steel dust. 
Uh, there is no cement, no Portland cement involved. The steel dust is actually the binder that holds the glass together. Uh, we are basically rusting the entire uh, glass material together using not regular air and water, but CO2. Um, and it might seem strange to imagine that CO2 can be trapped in a solid. CO2 is a gas, but briefly it dissolves into the water. It forms something that scientists call carbonic acid, which sounds very nasty, but it's actually seltzer water, fizzy water, bubbly uh, soda pop, which is, uh, makes a nice drink, but it's also very corrosive to iron. And we use that corrosiveness to help rust the glass together. And in reaction with the CO2, the iron and the water forms a mineral, iron carbonate. And so the gas goes into the solid, into the liquid, and then becomes a solid and is permanently trapped in that form as a mineral. So the, the process itself is carbon negative. Uh, the bench here weighs about 2,400 pounds, uh, and there's maybe something like 200 pounds of CO2 trapped in that bench. So that's where the phrase sitting down on, on CO2 comes from. We are literally sitting on carbon dioxide on that bench. Um, oh. uh, let me figure out which button to push and point out that this is a CO2 canister here, compressed CO2, and it goes through this line into the bench, back and forth through the material, and um, we embed these perforated pipes in the material so the gas can go through that pipe and then diffuse out through the material. And that's how it hardens. We've made other things like this uh, sidewalk here um, in the same way. By the way, this is um, Lisa Jackson, former administrator of the EPA, testing out our sidewalk and looking at our at our um, operation. We poured a 28-foot slab, just as you would do with concrete. No sand, no gravel, no Portland cement, but uh, the glass that we've been collecting from the desert. Uh, the steel dust, which we got from a, for free from a, a big steel fabrication company in Phoenix. Happy to get rid of it. It's not recycled. It would have gone to the landfill. Um, I asked for some steel dust, they said, well, you have to take all of it, 65 tons. So we had truckload after truckload. We have steel dust for years uh, to build these things with. Um, we also made walls. You can see here, these are um, about three feet tall, seven feet long. They are walls made out of the same mix to hold the materials that they're actually made out of we needed a material storage uh, structure uh, on our work site. Uh, we also very recently started to do some artwork and um, other types of products with this material. Here is a shrine made by the latest uh, student assistant, Drew Harris, who is in the audience. He'll come up with us in a few minutes and talk about this further, but this was, I think, certainly for me, uh, an eye-opening, a heart-opening um, experience to see someone use the material in such a meaningful way. And as you see here, he tied this material back to the very um, aspects that Richard was talking about earlier. And finally, I'll end with a few slides that show some of the architecture that predated the Spanish invasion of the Tohono O'odham lands in southern Arizona. Um, they were master builders like some of the other Southwest peoples, the Pueblo people of northern New Mexico. Uh, this is uh, the site known as Snake Town. It was uncovered in the 30s and then reburied to protect the site. It was a uh, 
a um, vast city or village complex made out of earthen materials. Um, another example, Casa Grande, southeast of Phoenix, uh, made in the, um, an early version of rammed earth, I think you would say. Um, still, some of the remnants, the ruins stand today. Um, they practice some of the same masterful desert architecture that um, others have. Very thick walls which retain the coolness uh, during the summer and the warmth in the winter. Um, embedded in the ground. And finally, the, one of the most famous places of all, uh, Casa Benito in uh, Chaco Canyon, as it was when it was functioning as a village. So the point is that when people ask us, well, what, what do you hope to build? What can you imagine building with this material and others that are greener uh, and more environmentally benign? Well, certainly there's a tradition. We don't have to wait on even modern engineers or architects. There is a thousand-year-old tradition amongst the people here that um, was highly developed and um, were, though mostly abandoned uh, on the, uh, at the onset of a huge drought in the 1300s. We are now, supposedly, according to the climate change modelers, face, facing another so-called mega drought uh, that may be coming uh, in, the, in the decades ahead. So we need to prepare, especially us in the Southwest where it's already dry and hot to begin with, for even drier and hotter conditions. And one way of doing that is to change the architecture, the design of the houses and the buildings that are, that are built now, which do not, uh, are not very energy efficient. So with that, I'll end, and we'll begin our, our question and answer period. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Well, we're going to bring chairs out for our, our speakers. And there is a microphone in the center back. If you have questions, please go to the mic. And our speakers are looking forward to talking. So uh, do we, if we don't have a question right away from the audience, um, I did have um, one question. Marissa McInnes, uh, who is the program manager for the uh, Tribal Legal Ambassadors Program, has joined us uh, now. And uh, she also worked for AmeriCorps as a uh, crew leader working with Clinket uh, youth to build and repair hiking trails in the Alaskan wilderness before coming to EPA, so she knows whereof she speaks. Um, and she has a Master of Science in Environmental Science and Policy from the Johns Hopkins University also. So welcome joining us. And we have a few other, uh, uh, Jane Latane from uh, Tohono Community College and Drew Harris, and we're very glad to welcome them. And I'll start by asking Marissa a question. Um, there are other tribal eco ambassador programs in other parts of the country. Can you tell us just a little bit about those other programs that we didn't have a chance to speakers prior today. Sure, thank you. Um, so Dr. Marco Hatch is with the Northwest Indian College, and he is this year um, doing a study on testing traditional ecological um, knowledge ways, traditional ways of preparing shellfish to avoid biotoxins that have caused paralysis. Um, over the years. So he is out in the Puget Sound right now <laughs> um, testing and sampling. Uh, we really wanted him to come and share, but he is, um, this is the best time apparently to test um, and to gather shellfish for testing. And then um, you heard from Michelle some of the other projects from last year. We, uh, we've had a lot of water quality monitoring, air quality monitoring, um, recycling, and um, and the energy efficiency study was um, was an, at another college, North Dakota, last year, and that was very successful. Um, basically, creating a competition between students, uh, between the classes on campus, uh, to see who could basically retrofit fit their dorm um, and their area of the school to um, to save the most energy. And the entire time they were learning about that process, several of them were environmental engineering students, so it was some of the work that they. Um, we're going to do in the future, 
um, and they shared it with the community. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, David, would you like to talk a little bit more about Drew and James' as, uh, participation in the program since they weren't speakers today? Um, well, maybe we could speak for ourselves. <laughs> um, yes, I'm the Vice President for uh, Research and Development at Tohono O'odham Community College, which is an accredited uh, two-year institution that's also a land-grant institution of higher education. And we, I do want to thank uh, the EPA and the ECHO Ambassador Project. Uh, we had one, uh, received two years of funding, and we started from ground zero in terms of the resources to do this project. So we are extremely grateful for the funding and also very excited about the results at the end of our two-year project. And um, uh, Drew joined us for the summer as a student intern, so. Yes, I, uh, I joined them this summer um, on this glass recycling project and my objective was to make an art sculpture um, f from this material um, and tie it into some of the issues, well the main issue uh, on our nation and that's alcohol abuse. And although this is a two year project, um, this issue, I mean, has real deep roots within our culture. And um, I don't know if we could go back and, and kind of show on the presentation so I could kind of explain it to you. Um, but as I said, the, the, there's several um, grottos on the side of the road um, as you come up from Tucson on Ajo Highway from several individuals who have, may have passed away from um, you know, drunk drivers, um, and, and so that's kind of where I got this idea. But my sculpture represents a transmutation of energy from historical trauma to a positive future, and the candle in the center, which was also um, picked up from on-site cleanup from one of the communities, represents uh, all the prayers and all the uh, people who have passed from uh, alcohol abuse, and and just and just to touch on again uh, what Richard was saying, that there's an understanding out there that whatever you do put into the universe, it comes back in another way, and so the efforts you know. Uh, being part of TOCC, having the opportunity to come up here and learn that a lot of these issues are being brought to the light and are being taken care of is such a blessing. And so uh, I'm very thankful to be a part of this and uh, thank you, thank you all. Uh, I'd just like to add, uh, right now we're working with uh, the communities and to to really start cleaning up, but in that hopes, you know, our college's only been ten years, but with TK and traditional knowledge, a lot of traditional as a, these traditional people all over the world really practice like a lot of these things that scientists don't really understand that all those things go together. It's, even in your sciences, if you teach the kids in, in traditional, their traditional and their identity, <clears throat> because a lot of these things were taken away from them as children, and they're taken away from their parents. If you, if you teach them back, their, give them back their culture, ingrain those traditions, and there's reasons why traditionalists didn't want to give up those things. They would rather die because they knew, they knew way ahead of time that these kind of things would come with the invasion and all these things. Even though I really had to look at myself, look in myself to forgive and just, and I'm of this generation and I'm of all, all you people in the world, but 
is that understanding that those things go together. <clears throat> Once you take those things apart, separate them, and start all these corporations and industries start just going out for their own. They don't care for no people no more. And I read a lot and I do a lot about it. I try to understand this <clears throat> thought of capacity and and these days it's all about money, capitalism and all that. But they don't care about just people at the grassroots. And now, I guess now we're going to see and we're going to learn what the outcomes of those things are to come our way if we don't uh, pay attention and be mindful of each other, be mindful of the natural things in the world that give us life, give us a um, way to live, even, even our foods. All those things are just taken for granted. These comforts are taken for granted. There's a reason why a lot of indigenous people lived off the land. And I'm, I'm not saying that things aren't good these days. It's just, it's just uh, understanding that a lot of those traditionalists hold, and even people in the world uh, of all different cultures that, that know these things now, <clears throat> I really um, acknowledge them, you know, even to start coming up, start <clears throat> making a point about these things that will help us on this earth. Thank you. And if I, if I could add to that, is this working? Uh, one of the really exciting things that this meeting was sharing the results with each of our projects and um, Renee and Zara looking at um, the causes of diabetes, which the tonatum are related to the Pima and have an extremely high rate of diabetes, which is tied in with alcohol as well as poor foods. And so we're we just enjoyed the opportunity to brainstorm about how we can collaborate more on some of our projects. And uh, the, these issues um, that are represented here are three of the biggest issues that face tribal people, I think. And just one of the things that I think made our uh, intervention so successful, because it's really, well, first of all, CDC's been telling people for years to eat more fruits and vegetables. And that, you know, that's not working. So uh, what we did with our uh, interventions was we took the approach that, because uh, um, our students were primarily um, American Indian. So the food supply has been colonized, okay? So the food has changed. And they learned deeply what happened to the food over the years. And I think by them doing their own research to determine how what's in the food, uh, they became to became more under they understood what had happened to the food supply and what colonization of the food supply really means and the introduction of invasive toxic substances like mercury and you know trace levels of arsenic and cadmium and pesticides. So when they learned to eat better. Then we saw the significant uh, decreases in BMI and weight and in, uh, their fasting glucose. So um, just communicating to them uh, in a culturally um, competent manner in language that they could understand, you know, like colonization of the food supply, that I think was really part of the success of the program. The mic brought. Do we have a volunteer who can help bring the mic down? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. We've got someone at the audience. Mm -hmm. yes. oh. um, well, actually, I have several questions. I'll try to figure out. Well, I'll just ask two really quick. Because um, I think the, during the discussion, you alluded to one of them. And why was it? First of all, the, all the panelists were just fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing what you're doing. It's it's really um, just incredible what you're doing and really wonderful to have um, EPA support. And so important, um, 
that's in my house is, is really powerful. I think sort of like what Richard was maybe alluding to that, um, or um, somebody was about, um, when you, I think it was the, the colonization, when you, when you show things or say things in ways that are relevant to people, it really makes such an impact. So getting that out and the information from Fort Peck about the high fructose, um, you know, the fructose levels was just incredible. We're going to go home and, and see what we have that has high fructose corn syrup and get, get rid of it. <laughs> because that's just, I mean, it's just so powerful and it's so important to other Indian communities to get the word out about that. So I was wondering about how you all are thinking about ways to share the information even more and, um, and if you're going to continue. So that's my last, or maybe my question is more about sustainability, how you're going to sustain it and scale it up. Um, you know, what you're doing is just amazing at Tomorrow Autumn, the, the glass. That's just, just incredible. So I was wondering, are you running out of glass or do you still have a lot of glass to work with? Um, and then, you know, what are your So oh. I will, so thank you, that was a lot of questions, so we'll try, I'll um, respond, I guess, as a representative of UBA, and then I'll pass it to you guys so you can talk about what you're doing for the sustainability of the project. Um, so this is the second year that EPA has done this. It's really the first um, official connection that we've had with tribal colleges through a grant. Uh, and our intention is exactly what you said, to make sure that um, the results and all of the work doesn't get lost. Um, and so one of the ways that we've been doing that over the past two years is um, the, um, at the beginning of each academic year, in October or November, we have an orientation at EPA headquarters. Um, and we have all the EPA scientists that work on these things, this type of issue, and the tribal program managers um, come engage with the tribal college professors to make sure that they're hooked in so they have EPA scientists to provide technical assistance if needed, um, to make sure that link is there so they feel supported throughout the year. So that's one aspect of it. Um, and then the other aspect, and this is actually part of our summer meeting, um, we We've been meeting with um, both people at EPA. They've been sharing with the tribal program staff at EPA. 18,000 people at EPA, it's a lot of people. So uh, we're getting the word out. And also bringing in interagency folks to tell them um, about what we're doing to see if we don't have funding, it's tight budget times, you know, where is their funding? Where are their opportunities? Um, and they even, um, were we were privileged to get a request um, to present at the White House. So they, they've they presented their information to the top pe level people to really ensure that that message is there. Um, and so that's from EPA's point of view. And then I will, you know, let the colleges talk about what they're doing individually um, to create sustainability with um, with their projects. So I don't know if Tahona Odom wants to go first. Or oh, well, s since you mentioned the glass project, we are very concerned to keep it going. And we are allocating some limited funding right now from our land grant um, office endowment funds, which are, you know, have a, we can use them for a um, variety of purposes. But yes, we're looking around for other grants and hopefully we'll start a, a viable business at some point. But as we look at economic development, um, uh, you know, you have to meet certain criteria. So we are looking and uh, there's great interest from the tribal leadership um, and we're working with uh, the tribal departments too to look for ways to keep it going. So the, the online macroepigenetics nutrition intervention course is hosted on the Food Ingredient Health Research website, which is the only nonprofit 5013C in the country focused on uh, food ingredient safety. And um, Fort Peck doesn't have uh, an online capacity to carry the, to the course or the funding. So what we're in, and Food Ingredient Health Research Institute um, provided in-kind contributions and so forth to, to make the project as, success, as successful as it was for the two years that it was happening. So our plan um, is to go after funding with um, uh, other universities. We're working with the University of Hawaii now on a, uh, a new grant application. And uh, we will try to uh, get funding 
through grants to continue the research to uh, just to dig deeper into the gene environment interactions that are occurring that cause insulin resistance. And um, that's, the, that's the best we can do. We, we actually had a student in our course last year that is very active in um, um, advocacy for tribes. And so she's paved the way and, uh, for us to uh, um, do a workshop in Research Triangle Park in a couple of weeks through the Health Disparities Conference that the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences is putting on. So that's a way to get the word out. And, uh, you know, uh, people who learn about how gene environment interactions work become, uh, they become motivated, some of them, to make changes in their own lives and then in their communities. So education is the key. And so we'll do everything we can to keep it going. Yeah, I just wanted to, did you have a question? Yeah, but let, why don't you speak first? Yes, okay. All right, so our, our uh, whole project evolved several times um, over the time, and we handed in different formats of what we were doing because through the course of doing the project, then we came in contact with other specialists in other universities, and they were very eager to be part of it. And so I would mail Marissa, okay, here's the newest upgrade. And um, we had partnerships with NAU. There was an air quality specialist who actually came to, into my classes and presented on indoor air quality, as well as then trained the students on the dust tracks and told us, you need to order these things, which I, I, air quality is not my field. So that was amazing. And then in the past, I've had um, partnerships with NCAR uh, and CU up in Boulder. And so we were able to take students there for training. And one of the professors came down to Diné College and actually helped develop a lab and then worked in the, with our interns to help them develop the projects that you saw. So that was amazing. And then when I come together, and I think when we all, we didn't know each other at all, we come together and then we find out about each other's very different work and we're very interested. David Stone, we're going to have come to Diné College. I already have the PowerPoint from Renee, which I incorporate in my environmental science class. And so things then grow. Is the uh, pond protein a uh, transporter or is it an enzyme? What's the nature of the pond protein? Oh, the pond protein? Yeah. The pond protein is calcium dependent. And uh, so US USDA scientists actually did a study on humans and they found that the humans consumed high fructose corn syrup. And they found that the uh, uh, consumption of high fructose corn syrup leads, leads to zinc loss and when magnesium intake is already low than calcium losses. And the, and the USDA scientists warn that uh, these calcium losses could cause problems. So PON1 gene is calcium dependent, and uh, the American population is already uh, highly uh, de deficient in magnesium. They're, they're not getting enough magnesium. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of problems in our population associated with the uh, American food supply. Um, you know, osteoporosis and, and um, lots of diseases that are uh, related to calcium loss. Did that answer your question? Yeah, but what exactly is the pond protein? What's its function? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it it uh, produces an enzyme called paraoxinase, and the paraoxinase is required to break down uh, uh, organophosphates like uh, chlorpyrifos pesticide or malathion. Um, and so you can't break those, down those pesticides and excrete them without the PON1 gene. Okay. okay. And is there a, uh, is the uh, concentration of mercury fairly high in, in the Fort Peck region because of the uh, coal in the area? Um, I don't know what the concentration in the air is. We get mercury uh, exposures not only in the air we breathe, but you know when you have mercury amalgam in your teeth, every time you chew, you get a release and it goes into your olfactory bulb. 
Uh, you get mercury exposures in, your, in the food from trace amounts that are allowed. You know, like, for example, the, there's an allowable amount of mercury in uh, chlorine for bleaching flour. So uh, the international food standards allow uh, trace levels of mercury and chlorine used to bleach flour. So uh, it's not just there that it's allowed. It's allowed in food dyes. Uh, and, um, um, you know, that's just how it is. It's, it, it's for shelf life, product shelf life. Mercury um, helps kill things like single-celled organisms, um, mold and and uh, bacteria and so forth. That's why if you have a bag of wheat flour on your shelf that's uh, or, uh, conventionally grown, it, there's pesticide residue in it, plus a little chlorine bleach if it's bleached, or white flour, and that'll last on your shelf forever. But uh, if you put a bag of organic flour on your shelf, it will go bad within a few weeks. You'll have bugs growing and stuff. So you have to put your organic flour in the refrigerator. It'll stay good there. So the, the, um, the exposures to trace heavy metals or pesticides are just a matter of course. They, they happen in the food we eat. And depending on where we live, like, like people that live closer to a coal-fired power plant have more mercury exposures. And uh, there's already there's an increase in autism if you're located near a coal-fired power plant. Or if there's uh, air pollution. Air pollution, if you're in an urban area, there, the prevalence of autism is higher. So gene-environment uh, interactions are occurring. Um, and so we, we don't exist in little self-contained bodies. You know, we're impacted by the environment we live in. And what we eat determines how our genes behave, how well we're able to process those toxins that, that are coming into our bodies. Did that answer your question? Yes, um, I just like I just say you know, even just educational part of it and the philosophy and for for native students, it just really brought a lot of understanding of concept of um, writing and who's who's writing what and what they're writing about and how we can be mis misunderstood or mistook in, in different ways. And and these like people of the world and and blinded by all these things and really not seeing beyond seeing beyond the forest the fire that's coming our way and so it just education for native students is just really cool and at my age yeah I was I was asleep when when I was in my drunkenness all those years. And I did work and do stuff and <clears throat> tried to do the best I can. But when I came out of it, I said to myself, I just went to college. And I just wondered what, what happened to the world while I was in my drunkenness? What happened to <clears throat> all those people that were supposed to be taking care of the world? I woke up and I started reading all this stuff started realizing, whoa, it's really cool. Education is really cool. Whoever thought that school would be so cool and, and the things I'm learning and just, and reinforcing those thoughts and those beliefs that, that should live with the soul and, and educate the people on these things that corrupt our society, corrupt our beliefs and corrupt our minds because they already corrupted the earth and start taking it back. Thank you. I think I want to add something else. Um, certainly you've heard Richard say, uh, you know, how he's been impacted. And um, I had three interns that stayed, one dropped out, and uh, they were older. And one I, I know very well, and he actually is taking care of my house while I'm here. But at one point, he dropped out of school. He was very intelligent, very smart. But he dropped out of school, and I kept e emailing him, saying, why are you doing this? And he said, oh, I'll come back. And he did come back this year. But then halfway through the program, 
he didn't want to continue. And he didn't want to continue with the internship. And, um, you know, I sat down and I talked with him, you know, saying, and this was, I think, March. And, uh, you know, talking, you know, you just have a little bit, let's go through this, let's complete. And he, he was the only one to go to the uh, Fort McDowell Air Symposium. And he said, okay, I'll continue. And he developed his poster, he went there. And now, at the end, now he's in another internship. He, he wants to impact his people, the Navajo people, his grandparents, his grandparents raised him, they raised sheep, and he says, I want to impact them. And so working on the indoor air quality, he could directly show, you know, this is what's going on in your Hogan, and he developed um, a program showing how to dry the wood properly so you don't have increased creosote, how you can improve your stove, and this is for people in the community. So, you know, that directly impacts their lives, and that's what he wants to do. And now he's working this summer um, about how to raise sheep, how to raise um, of uh, food directly in a dry land environment. And he changed his major, both, I had both of the interns change their major to environmental science, and now they have a direction in, in their life. Uh, the, another older intern, um, he had difficulty with math, he had difficulty with writing, and I would help him write his proposals and things like that. and. Um, now he's at NAU doing another internship and he's going to NAU full time this fall and he's with programs where he can come back and help the communities. So it's these kinds of educational outreach programs that really can change lives. Thank you. Right now at TOCC we just had a bridge program for the young with the high schoolers, nothing but girls showed up. But it's really, it's really cool because we had one talk to an astronaut just over a few months, about in this month, and and she and she's really smart in math, and and I just really, I really admire that because a lot of the, a lot of the women are more <clears throat> really caring and and can take that in, but even a lot of the, the students are, we're having more and more students, and we just started the college, and we have a basketball team. The girls come from different, uh, different community colleges, too, to play for us, universities. We have a girl, she's, uh, she's got her degree in, um, what was it? Uh, but she takes care of the city lights, everything. But she she would rather she back, came all the way back down to the community college. She's an architect and she takes care of Tucson City. But she came to play for the school. And then we have girls that come from from Diné and they're 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 real. And we have our own our own girls too there too. And we really have some smart girls and some smart men that are going out and doing stuff in the community. And we had a few students barely came back from Haskell. Haskell and some working with NASA. And so I really think that with that TEK and that, we can protect uh, a lot of the native lands and what, what we have, at least for now, and for our children too, to come and, and educational wise for everyone. We got a couple more, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to thank everyone first for, for the sharing. It's really been wonderful. And it was nice to hear Richard bring up the traditional ecological knowledge. A couple of years ago, Gregory Cajete and Melissa Nelson were here. And Gregory kept asking the question, where is the indigenous in all this? Where is the indigenous? And there's got to be like 100,000, maybe more years of traditional environmental, ecological knowledge out there. And what I hear is the scientist, and I'm traditionally trained. I mean, I flew jets off of carriers for the Navy, which is just a wild thrill. I've got an honors degree in engineering. My 
My PhD work was in ecology and ecological modeling. But it wasn't until I was working out in the Philippines and other places, and I realized that the knowledge that traditional people had really far exceeded what academia has. There's this thing called resilience. It's not about sustainability, it's about resilience. It's about an ecosystem, about a culture being able to, to recover from whatever is thrown at it. And I just wonder if the EPA and some other people will open more to having their scientists be trained by the traditional people <laughs> instead of the way we go around of thinking that us, traditional, us conventionally trained scientists really have a lot to offer. We do, but not as much as I think we think we do. Well, thank you. So I will um, thank you for that. Um, so I will quickly answer that um, with the answer that we're still working on it. Um, but one thing that um, this group was very um, poignant about when they met with a lot of top EPA, um, Office of Research and Development scientists, these are the folks who kind of keep the model, the science model going. Um, and I think it was very impactful. We had a discussion targeted at TEK. Um, and that led into, we actually just had our first um, interagency workshop on TEK this past June. And a lot of what um, the great folks in this group did was help to kind of fuel that fire and to get that um, train of thinking, line of thinking going. We had it on a Daga a couple, or last month. Um, and I'm already in the tribal program at EPA, and I think within the tribal programs in our Office of Water, Office of Air, um, we are right there with you. We understand that. Um, there's a TEK model, and then we're calling it SEK model, the traditional scientific ecological knowledge, um, knowing that they're parallel tracks and that um, they're completely different systems. And you're right about the resiliency. It should be about shifting to you know, new systems, not just trying to sustain maybe the ones that weren't working. Um, so we are in full throttle trying to get everything that we um, were schooled on, basically, by really, really um, um, important and emphatic tribal leaders that were there. Um, we're trying to get that going. And I think that the agency, I'm not going to speak for the agency as a whole, but just in what I'm seeing in, um, in the tribal programs, we are being reached out to by the, um, and I call them like the super nerds, by the people, the really left brain scientists, the, re the science advisory board people, the people that really, um, that's what they do is focus on the science and the quality assurance of everything. Um, and we're getting contacted by them and they're listening. Um, and so there will be a shift. And I know that Michelle, who you heard earlier, um, that's one of her priorities. She really wants to see how we can better work um, and integrate TEK into our daily work, science work. So it's a long way coming, and there are agencies that are doing it better, and we know that, and so we're gonna work with them um, and have them kind of help us show the way. But um, folks like these who are doing all the great work, the more that they can talk to EPA scientists, the better. I think we have one final question. A quick question, kind of a follow-on from the last one. Uh, the name of the program, uh, thank you again very much, fantastic projects, and thank you for sharing them. Um, the idea of Eco Ambassador, are you all ambassadors from the tribes, from the tribal colleges to the EPA, or ambassadors from the EPA to the tribes, or a little bit of both? The idea of being a liaison with the um, sharing the importance of traditional ecological knowledge makes me think you're more of an ambassador on that side. But then you're working with the scientists at the EPA, which means you're bringing in their knowledge to the tribe. So it's both. I'm just going to say, I can't see you, but I recognize that voice. Is that Al, <laughs> Is that Al from AHEC? Hi, that nice to see you. <laughs> um, well, I appointed myself as Eco Ambassador of Native Hawaiians recently, using my Eco Ambassador status. Uh, and and uh, and Because the, the Native Hawaiians don't really have any um, well, they're just sort of left out there. And um, I met with a lot of them on Oahu, and, and the EPA, uh, Marissa helped us organize a meeting where we could bring uh, various people from different agencies uh, together to hear about macroepigenetics and what the Native Hawaiian community is trying to build in Hawaii. They're trying to build a college program, a bachelor's degree, 
that's based on TEK. They're calling it something else, but it's bringing the indigenous knowledge of agriculture, uh, of uh, organic farming, to a degree program and teaching, uh, you know, students how to how to grow. Uh, food, healthy food that's based in uh, the old way, indigenous way of growing. So, um, yeah, and I used to work at EPA, so in my prior career. So I'm sort of like an eco ambassador going both directions, but um, I'm definitely way more out there in uh, yeah, working with tribes and, and uh, Native Hawaiians than working with the feds. As far as I know, I'm not getting paid to work for the vets. And I just wanted to add, like, you know, with the gentleman's question before, um, I think that's what we're doing here. We're, we're balancing, it's a balance act, having both the native knowledge with traditional Western culture knowledge. That's what we're doing in this present time. Um, it's about building that energy, you know, awakening our youth. Um, from all over the tribes um, that opportunities like this where I'm able to come out here and witness what's going on I can take that back with my community and share it and it's like I mean with my project it's called answered prayers that's what a prayer is it's 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 a a wave of energy that that keeps building keeps building and the more you know, we 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 awaken our youth. Uh, we're able to touch, you know, grow, grow. So I feel that's what we're doing here in this present time. I mean, <laughs> you know, we have Richard. We have a strong community member who's, I mean, just sharing so much and gaining a lot of knowledge from the other side, and we're going to be able to take that back. And, and, you know, we're, we're growing. We're growing as a nation, and it's a beautiful thing to see. So with our project, um, it's like housed through the college, but we do report to, like, the tribal council on what's going on, what were our results, um, and then they give us feedback, and then obviously we also, like, have our quarterly meetings, you know, with the EPA through conference calls. So we're kind of like a liaison between the community college, the tribal council, and while working with EPA. With myself as an eco ambassador, uh, I don't know, it's really been crazy. I've been all over now. I've actually been to Nevada to speak with the scientists that gathered there, and the EPA from all the regions in the south. And somehow, I don't know how it happened, they put me up front just to talk about TEK. And just being here in Washington, it's like my fourth time uh, for the school. And this having to, an ambassador for the school, just funding uh, acknowledgement about what's going on. And even with the kids at home, letting them know what's out there what's going on and it's really cool for our kids. Our kids have plantations at the school now, even at the elementary elementary school and in the communities and a lot of things are happening in the communities now. It's really, uh, I really love it. And I might not be a part of a lot of it or some of it, but a lot of people that I know are connected to it and they continually talk to me and I talk to them and so it's just working together and working together with people like Marissa and and uh, Erica. I'm really trying to remember her last name. Newland, Erica Newland, and and just knowing those things that are supportive of the Native communities and Native colleges to really educate our kids and educate our. Our kids, because our kids are, it, the community colleges are connected with the community, and the communities, they really take home a lot, and, and, and those are the most important things for our communities, because we're not, we don't have a lot. We don't have a lot in the communities, and the community colleges educate our kids on the culture, revitalizing the culture, 
on the knowledge of what's going on in society today and just in the writing, the sciences, the math, and all those things that are important to protect our people and our land and the things that are especially important to the outer mainstream, mainstream society and all those things that just reinforcing that in our children so they can have an effect. Even the littlest thing can affect thousands, maybe millions of people. And that's really hopeful that we see it that way. Thank you. Well, hopeful is a good note to end on, I think. I want to thank all our speakers. Each presentation was informative and inspiring. And I'm also looking forward to the commercialization of the CO2 negative material. So you can expand on that. It's very exciting as each program we've heard about today. And I'd like to thank our wonderful partners, the EPA, and thank our audience and enjoy what's left today of the Living Earth Festival and come back tomorrow. Thank you very much. And